Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Dr. Shreful Halib and today we're going to talk about the cardiac stress testing. Okay, let's go on with it. So, the cardiac stress testing can be mainly of two types. You can have an exercise stress testing or you can have a pharmacologic stress testing. What is this all about? The idea here is you have a patient who demonstrates classic symptoms of angina and you want to make sure that yeah it is really angina by inducing the stress on the heart by putting the stress on the heart you will see the ischemic changes okay so this stress on the heart can be given by the exercise or it can be given by drugs which is called the pharmacologic stress and when you put those kind of stresses, the exercise of pharmacologic stress, then there are some changes in the perfusion level of the heart, and also there are some changes in the level of contraction of the heart. So you, if you do an ECG, you will have able to catch up the changes. You will see the ischemic changes in the ECG. If you do an ECO, you will also be able to change, see those changes as regional wall measured abnormality. And moreover, you can also see those changes by radionuclide imaging or also called the nuclear stress test by putting some dye in the patient's blood and seeing the uptake of this dye if in, in the myocardial tissue. If the uptake is low, then you can say that, yeah, there is a reduced perfusion or there is ischemia. So the cardiac stress testing is a very uh, important test in cardiac diagnostics, but you have to be careful of about choosing the type of testing according to the type of patients you are dealing with so you have to take into consideration uh, multiple factors like the patient's ability to exercise the idea here if a patient is able to exercise you should do the exercise stress test or ETT but if a patient uh, who is unable to do an exercise like if he or she has a broken limb or arthritis or some kind of joint problems muscle problems etc then you will do a pharmacologic stress testing like you will give him a drug and those drugs will work on the heart muscle and just increase the requirement of oxygen and also another important point of consideration is that ECG of this patient if the ECG of the patient the baseline ECG is normal then you can do a stress ECG but if the patient's baseline ECG is abnormal to such extent that it will interfere with your interpretation then better not to do a stress ECG rather go to do a stress echo or a stress nuclear imaging those are better okay then also important into con also important to consider is a history of prior revascularization another important thing here is medication you, you should take a history of drugs like beta blockers like calcium channel blockers and nitrates those are the anti angina drugs that reduces the load on the heart you want to stop those drugs because they will interfere with your results and stop them before like two days like 48 hours before the test because you want those drugs to get washed away from the patient's body okay so here we come to the fast stress test which is called the ETT uh, the excess or also known as exercise ECG or stress ECG. So this is a 12-bit ECG which is recorded during an exercise in a treadmill or a bicycle ergometer following the Bruce protocol. And in some patients like weak patients or older patients, we might use another protocol called the modified Bruce protocol. Here, the patient walks and then runs on a treadmill or bicycle ergometer and we just uh, do the ECG. But as the patient's limbs are moving, so we do not put the electrodes on the limbs. Rather, we put the upper limb, upper limb electrodes on the shoulder and the lower limb electrodes on the hips. And during exercise, we also record the blood pressure and assess the patient's symptom by looking at the patient directly and talking to him or her. Okay, so here are a list of ETT. Number one, our most important. To confirm the diagnosis of angina you, you have a patient who is uh, like 50 years old has diabetes has pain just pain on exhaustion and the pain is relieved by taking uh, rest or taking uh, glycerol tinnitrate this is a very high risk patient having angina so you might want to do an ETT another patient like a patient of 20 years female does not have diabetes or any other comorbid illness she has some pain in the chest which is reduced or relieved by taking 
some NTL sorrent. Then you might not, not uh, do an ETT in this patient because this is a very low risk of uh, cardiac problems. There is very low risk of ischemia or angina. So this is the situation. Number two, to evaluate the treatment response in documented coronary disease. So in those cases, you might, you should not stop the antiangelal drugs. Rather, you just go on with the drugs and then put the patient on the treadmill or give the patient the pharmacologic agents to put the stress on the heart. Then to identify patients with coronary artery disease who might have a very high risk of having acute coronary events. Another important indication is to assess the prognosis following myocardial infarction very important we do this kind of edt after like two weeks or three weeks after the myocardial infarction even another important consideration is uh, to assess the outcome after coronary revascularization like pci so after pci we expect to increase the perfusion to the coronary muscles and we we don't want to see the inducible ischemia so we we want the we want to see the improvement so that's why we want to do an ett and also to diagnose and evaluate the treatment response, treatment of exercise-induced arrhythmias. So those are the lists of uh, indications of exercise tolerance test. Next, what are the positive findings or the high-risk findings in DT? Number one, low threshold for ischemia. Like the if the patient develops chest pain within stage one or stage two or the earlier phases of the Bruce protocol, then this patient, this finding is very high risk finding. Number two, a fall in blood pressure on exercise, very important. Number three, and the most important one is the widespread marked or prolonged ischemic EC changes. And those changes classically are planar or down sloping acid depression of more than one millimeter. Another finding is exercise-induced arrhythmia. And that here are a list of contraindications. You should not do an ETT in a patient with acute MI or unstable angina because the heart is already in a severe ischemic stress, so you don't want to put more stress on the heart. Then a symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. You all know that aortic stenosis can have those patients when the patient exercise they can have a syncopal attack, arrhythmia, which many often is fatal. And we also avoid do doing ETT in patients with acute pulmonary embolism, endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis, and dissection. Then we come to the pharmacologic stress testing. So those are preferred, preferred or performed in patients who cannot exercise or in patients with unpredictable baseline ECG and pacemaker. So the patients with unpredictable baseline ECG or pacemaker, those patients should not have a stress ECG. Rather, they will go on to a pharmacologic stress echo, like giving the patient a dobutamine, putting stress on the heart, and doing an echocardiogram. And the pharmacologic agents typically used are the vasodilators, which are more often used with radionuclide imaging. The common vasodilators are adenosine, diperidamol, regadenosine, and we must avoid using those vasodilator drugs in patients with bronchial asthma because it can aggravate the bronchial asthma, induce an acute attack of asthma. And what is the mechanism of vasodilator putting stress on the heart? The idea here is normally the ischemic tissue have produced a lot of uh, local mediators which produce vasodilation on the obstructed vessels. So the obstructed vessels or the vessels with atheroma are maximally obstructed at rest, but the normal vessel are not maximally obstructed or maximally dilated. When you put some dilator, vasodilators in the system, then it goes in the heart and produces more vasodilation in the normal blood vessel than the blood vessels which are obstructed or which are causing the ischemia. So the blood flow will be more to the normal tissues, will be more on the normal vasodilated, vasodilated areas. So the blood will be stolen from the ischemic areas and go to the lower resistance areas with the normal, very dilated blood vessels. So this coronary steel phenomenon will actually induce a stress or induce ischemia on the already low perfused tissue and you can see this ischemia by echo uh, where echo or the iridinical imaging 
another important uh, type of enzyme used are the endotropes or conotropes. Especially, you use the dobutamine with the eco stress test or stress eco. Here, you you just fast do an eco before putting the dobutamine. See the baseline of this patient's heart. And then you put a continuous IV infusion of the dobutamine and see the changes in the myocardium. There can be two types of changes. Number one, there can be a regional wall motion abnormality where the heart muscle is not contracting well after giving dobutamine. It means or it indica it's indicative of ischemia. Number two, there might have been an area normally which was not contracting well, but after giving dobutamine, those muscles are contracting well. This is called the hibernating myocardium. So those are the two situations you can see. So the myocardial segments with poor, sorry, the myocardial segments with poor perfusion, myocardial segments with poor perfusion will be ischemic and contract poorly under stress, which is called the wall motion abnormality. And in case of hibernating myocardium, you give low dose dobutamine, which induce contraction hibernating myocardium, and those patients with hibernating myocardium will actually benefit from a bypass surgery or a PCI. Okay, so those are the ideas of the cardiac stress testing. Thank you everyone for watching my video and like and subscribe to my channel.